to get started. And of course, we're welcoming people in um, as they come in. This is about a half hour session for Q&A, which is um, I'm delighted to be to be to be hosting with you all this morning. And, and as uh, Richie were saying, the launch um, of the program, you know, protecting every child's potential was just wonderful. Every you know, aspect of the of the presentation was was beautifully presented, and I think really provided a lot of very critical information um, uh, for us. Um, I'm just, I'm going to encourage everyone, and hopefully you can you can work the function. It's the question function where you can just uh, send questions through. So we'll try to get to everybody's questions this morning um, as we go. Just so you know, I'm I'm Glo Janata, and I'm the president and CEO of Togo Run. We're a a global communications healthcare agency and a proud supporter for many years now of, uh, of Pure Earth and its critical mission to, uh, to address disease causing pollution. So absolutely delighted to be here uh, this morning. What we love about Pure Earth is, as so many do, is that you guys identify the problem and then work relentlessly to solve it, solve those problems around the world. And, and uh, that's what we need more of uh, every day uh, to get those problems solved. And this initiative certainly is going to, is going to do that uh, between Pure Earth, UNICEF and Clarios. What an incredible group uh, of, uh, as Madeleine Albright uh, calls it, the magical trio uh, and coming together to really support this initiative. So this morning uh, we've got, as you know, Rich, Rich Fuller, uh, who is of course the president, founder and CEO of Pure Earth. Uh, Rich has, of course, brought his incredible background as uh, not only an environmentalist and, en and an engineer, but also as an entrepreneur looking to, you know, make things happen quickly, effectively, and, and pragmatically, and also staying focused, obviously, on, on the needs of children around the world and what, uh, what we can do to really better their lives. He also, of course, co-chaired the Seminal Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health, which identified disease-causing pollution as a leading cause of death. In fact, more than 16% of all deaths each year are, are uh, you know, related to disease-causing pollution. So critical mission, uh, and uh, you know, can't wait to, to hear more, Rich, from you this morning. And also, we're so excited to have Drew um, McCanter uh, on the phone, who's Pure Earth's Director of Global Policy and Planning. And Drew, Drew will oversee, he's actually, excuse me, responsible for uh, the partnership and will br be bringing his skills um, as a uh, health environmental specialist and a lawyer working over 11 years in the field, addressing, uh, you know, the, the toxic hotspots, you know, that, are, that, are, that have come up and that need to be addressed. And in particular, he is also um, a co-author of the Global Battery Alliance's uh, soon to be released report on the, be the best practices for acid battery recycling. So, Drew, I'd like to open up the questions with you. Could you please describe your role and, and uh, how you will be leading this partnership and how you would define success uh, for all of us as we, as we watch this partnership unfold and do great things? Sure, and thanks, Glo. So the first thing I would like to share about this is there's really two elements to the protecting every child's potential. There is the partnership and the initiative that today is um, founded by UNICEF, Pure Earth, and Clarios Foundation, and hopefully is joined by many more organizations. So there's a partnership level at the top, and then under that umbrella sits projects. Uh, so for Pure Earth, I'm managing both that partnership and our desire to bring more partners to the table, but then also the implementation of the projects below. So that's my role. And of course, there's a huge team of talented people working on the implementation, both in New York and at the country level. Um, but I'll be focused on both the implementation and a particular importance trying to bring in more partners because, you know, we're, uh, we don't have any illusions that this problem can be solved with just these partners or just the resources that are available to, today. So it's really critical to bring in partners with additional areas of expertise from the private sector, from the nonprofit sector, from, uh, you know, the bilateral development sector um, and really get everyone involved to, to bring this up to scale. Sounds wonderful. And we, we actually have a question from Alicia Ogawa, who is one of our uh, Pure Earth um, board members. And she says, I'm still learning a lot about lead issues. I, I would appreciate more information on the degree to which lead-based health issues are reversible or not. And is it completely reversible? And how long would that take? True, yours. <laughs> sure. So unfortunately with lead, once a child is exposed to lead, a lot of the health and intellectual damage that it does to them is irreversible. 
but that doesn't mean the future generations need to be exposed in the same way. So while removing lead from a child's environment can improve that child, some of the damage is permanent and irreversible, which is why it's imperative that we don't allow this to continue into the future. The next generation, there's no reason that they should be exposed at the level that current generations are. So a lot of our work is to reduce exposures among particularly severely exposed populations today but also to make sure that these sources of lead, be it battery recycling or pottery made with leaded glazes, that we stop that ongoing cycle of producing these products and using these products and recycling these products in a way that continues to expose children. Yeah, Rich. Let me add to that a little. Um, lead has so many impacts on the body. There's a systemic damage that's done when a child's brain is developing. And um, the way that this just is described to me um, by, by epidemiologists and, and neurologists is that during that early period in life, prenatal and the first year of life, while the brain is making its connections, especially in the frontal cortex, if you add lead in at that point, lead impedes those connections from being created. So when they look at animal studies, obviously we don't do this in children, they find that um, whereas normally each neuron has between 12 and 14 connections, um, if there's lead in the system, even at these low levels, you end up with only seven or eight connections. So you end up with a brain that's fundamentally different if, if the lead is present, even at low levels of that period in life. And that's what causes lower intelligence, more likelihood of being involved in violent behavior and the rest of it. So uh, that is permanent. Unfortunately, once the brain is fixed, it's done. There are, there are toxic impacts of lead that um, at, high, at very high exposure levels that if you reduce the exposure that they go away. So some of the immediate impacts, if you reduce the exposure goes away. But this one particular impact um, is definitely permanent, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Richard. And actually, uh, another board member, Charlotte Trefus, uh, wrote in and asked if you could perhaps explain a little bit more about the data uh, that supports this connection between uh, lead poisoning and, and also violence, because obviously that's, that's something that uh, is critical on both, both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, so the frontal cortex, which is where, again, we're talking about frontal lobe development. It's also the place where um, you, know, you have executive control. You can control your emotions, you can make analytical decisions um, and control and, and, and have self-control. So when that's damaged, um, uh, then what, what we find in, in studies, uh, there's been a, around 20 odd studies done over the last 30 years that look at lead levels in, in children at this early age. And then 18 years later, when those kids become adults and we can collect crime data, finding that the crime data is much higher when their lead levels are higher and reduces substantially as much as 70%. Crime, that crime statistics reduce enormously when lead levels in kids 18 years earlier plummet as well. So it is, a contentious uh, association still, it does need more work to really prove that it's a causality relationship and that's underway right now. But there are so many studies that show exactly this particular relationship. Um, let's see how the, this next analysis goes, but I, I suspect it's, uh, it's gonna, it's, it's, a, it's really gonna be a fundamental part of the lead equation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, thanks, Rich. And we have another question here from Francois Guillon, um, congratulating you know uh, everyone on the on the launch and the exceptional support um, from the leaders this morning. He has two questions. Um, out of the total exposure of 800 million children, what is your realistic ambition for impact? That's the first one. And the second one is, is there a plan to leverage the Global Battery Alliance to continue growing the positive impact with new partners from the private sector? Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. So the first uh, 
suite of, of projects that we've designed under PECP is in five countries that were mentioned in the launch, uh, launch event, and those are Ghana, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Georgia, and Mexico. And in those five countries, you know, our impact is limited, of course. Now, our ambition in the long term is to really make a sizable dent in this in this uh, issue across low and middle income countries. So as we bring in more resources and more partners, we hope to um, build out geographically and, and in more depth. Um, so this is really just a start. Um, let's see, what was the back half of that question? The second is, is there a plan to leverage the Global Battery Alliance to continue yeah. growing the positive impact with new partners from the private sector? Yeah, so as was mentioned earlier, um, the Global Battery Alliance will be releasing a best practices guidance on this and we see that as very positive development and hopefully that uh, really activates um, both governments and the private sector to get more involved in this. Through the, the participation and, and dedication of Clarios Foundation, we really have excellent reach into other private sector organizations, other industries even beyond um, just battery making and battery recycling, so potentially automotive or, you know, there's, there's so many sectors of the economy that rely on transportation and therefore rely on lead acid batteries. Um, of course, there's food production that's at, at play here. Um, we've, we've talked about other things um, such as pottery. Um, so there's so many sectors that maybe even unknowingly touch on this issue and have a role to play that need to be activated here. Mm -hmm. and, me, and, and, and oh, I'm sorry, Hedrick. Well, well in, in keeping with, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, and to, to build on that a little, when we're, when we're in a particular country, there is a method to the madness of how we're trying to reduce that country's lead exposure. And there is a kind of methodology that, that we have now that, that UNICEF, um, you know, will, will also adopt. Um, and that's, first of all, to work out, you know, where are the key sources? We, we know a lot of it is going to be from battery recycling, but often the battery recycling lead then gets used in things like spices or um, pottery or things like this. So once we know what the, the key sources of lead exposure into the kids are, then for each of those types of exposures, we've got a game plan for what's needed in order to be able to solve that particular exposure. And that game plan, you know, it's kind of in, involves quite a lot of government coordination. There's usually a need to do um, a tracing of where all of the different um, pathways and lead exposures are occurring throughout the economic chain of the product. And then there needs to be some regulatory input, but usually some kind of education to those producers and an alternate brought to bear appropriate to it. And we've been through this method, you know, been through this kind of path now in, in, in a dozen countries, testing what things work in each of these different kinds of sources. So we kind of have a decent idea, great starting platform to be able to tackle any one of these sources in any particular country. So it's a matter of kind of rolling out in a methodical fashion. I just also want to note one kind of important thing. Some of these sources, for example, we think spices will be kind of easy to deal with because there's really no impediment to changing to an alter alternate colorant for the spices. You know, it's added to make the spices look bright. Um, and it's something that government will be very keen to regulate. So those things I th we think are doable in a short term. Other issues like, you know, really knocking on the head the informal sector and developing the formal sector, the clean battery recycling sector substantively, that's a long process. It requires a lot of patience. It's going to require capital investment in many countries. It's going to require changes in economic incentives into industry so that batteries are directed to the clean sector and not to the dirty sector. And that can be done through economic mechanisms, which will take years for governments to enact and go through their processes. Mm -hmm. So 
I'm not saying any of this is easy or that it's going to be quick, but we do know how to do it. And it's just a matter of the patience going through the steps um, mm -hmm. in any particular country. On that, uh, Rich, also, can you ex explain or drew just a little bit more between the informal and the formal battery recycling process, just so we understand what that difference is? Sure, let me just sure. paint a picture for everyone of what an informal recycler looks like. And they're a little bit different depending on you know your, the country that you're looking at. But um, when I walk into these facilities, what it generally is, is I don't know if anyone can has seen a documentary of what like a, a 1990s jungle cocaine production facility looked like, but it kind of looks like that. You know, you're you're in um, a backyard or kind of an informal settlement. Um, maybe there's corrugated tin creating a little camp, and inside there you have stacks of uh, tens or hundreds of used what we commonly refer to as just car batteries, and they start by cracking them open and dumping out the sulfuric acid that's inside the battery on the ground or in a ditch, um, or some kind of drain. And then they take a machete to the top of the, and they cut the top of the plastic case off. Inside a battery is a series of lead plates. Lead makes up about 60% of the weight of the battery. And they dump those out. And then oftentimes there's simply a hole in the ground that has um, you know, a fuel source going in and they dump the lead plates in this hole in the ground. They melt it down, scrape off the impurities, and then just ladle that, uh, that molten lead out into bars that they sell back to refiners and ultimately to battery makers. So in this process, huge amounts of lead fumes go up into the air. Those are dispersed throughout the community. And of course, the camp itself is horribly contaminated. And the workers in these camps um, often have no protection of their own, which means that when they go home, they're completely covered in lead dust and they take all that dust home to their family. So there's multiple sorts, uh, sources and, and routes where lead migrates from these camps into the community. So that's the difference. And of course, the other challenge here is that formal sector recyclers are not all perfect themselves. So we've seen many formal sector recyclers that operate within a factory with, with large scale equipment that themselves are also releasing quite a bit of, of lead fumes and lead dust. So we really need to tackle both of these at the same time to bring the formal sector up to an environmentally responsible you know, operating procedures as well as shifting the flow of batteries out of the informal sector. Mm -hmm. And the good news is, again, that this is a doable, this can be done. And there are just methods that you can put into place that, that will actually be, you know, be successful in, 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 in addressing the issue. So that's wonderful. There's a question here from Anna Amuta saying, many of the communities who have contamination rely on the very cause for their livelihood. Can you speak to success cases of introducing new economic opportunities for these communities who rely on use of lead and mercury for their jobs? What were the challenges? How long did it take? What did you learn? And how would you do things differently with this learned experience to, to make sure we see success as quickly as possible? Sure. One interesting um, project that we were involved with took place in Vietnam, where an entire village was engaged in this practice of, of lead recycling. And the government there was actually quite proactive in moving all of that activity into an industrial estate, out of the community, and helping these, um, these recyclers upgrade their practices and their facilities such that they weren't poisoning the public. Um, so this, this is one kind of success that we saw. Pure Earth came in and helped remediate the village afterwards to prevent the public exposures. But in terms of livelihood, what we notice is that, you know, there's, there's many roles that the informal sector plays in the supply chain of used batteries. Most people are actually not involved in the smelting, the, the actual lead recycling, but are involved in the collection and transport of these batteries or in scrap dealing. There's far more people that are working on that, which is actually quite a useful function that they play because the formal supply chain for collecting and moving these batteries doesn't exist in many places. And so the informal sector that employs most of the people is actually a great service to the country. Um, when we look at the number of informal recycling camps that we see in the world and the average number of people that actually work on the smelting of that, it's not a tremendous number of people. 
we estimate that at a minimum there's 10 to 30,000 of these camps, likely many more, but each one only employs perhaps five to 10 people. So we're looking at somewhere between 50,000 and 300,000 people globally. Of course, these are estimates that are actually doing the part of this work that can't continue with many more people beyond that, actually providing quite a valuable service that does not present serious risk to the public. That's terrific. Um, and, and so it, how would you then, as you're looking at this as a problem, and, and because we brought up the idea of the other areas where there is contamination, for instance, with, with paint and, and contamination from, from uh, lead in paint, how would you describe sort of the different challenges for both of those and how they're, they're both being addressed? Yeah, paint certainly is a challenge. It's one of the ongoing lead exposure uh, sources that the world is probably most familiar with. First, it was lead and gasoline, which all but now one country has banned. Um, and there's been quite a lot of international action and attention and resources to solving the paint issue. What we've noticed is that there are a, a basket of other sources that are um, quite severe in terms of the level of exposure that they generate that just simply haven't gotten that level of attention or resources. So, um, you know, and the, the the contribution of these sources in each country is different country to country. Um, in some countries, you know, in the East Coast of the United States, paint is still quite a big deal. But in many low and middle income countries, we see that lead acid battery recycling is really a major driver. It's receiving very little attention. Um, in Mexico, pottery is a major driver. We're seeing throughout South Asia and probably the Middle East, North Africa region as a whole that spices are really an emerging issue. Emerging in terms of our knowledge of it, not that it's novel or new, um, and that we're probably just looking at the tip of the iceberg in terms of global awareness of um, lead and spices. And it's probably a much larger issue than anyone realizes. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, we know that one of the, the critical things that is so powerful about the work that Pure Earth does is, there, is the reliance on data-driven, you know, published data that is uh, pointing, you know, you you all in the in the direction that you you know you go in. What do you expect um, will be the biggest hurdles to achieve the toxic truth goals? And based on the data that we all know that uh, that you guys are relying on, how would you how would you uh, how would you address that? And that's a question, by the way, from Catherine Porte. Thanks. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Rich. Sorry. Have it both first, and then I'll pass to you, Drew. So, we've got program work going on now in five countries and funding to do what is the start of work in, in three of those countries. Perhaps in two countries, we can really go a long way, the smaller countries to solution. But the bigger countries, we're gonna need more time and more effort. We're only able to focus on a part of each. So in Mexico, we're really only focusing on the state of Puebla, which is the largest problem in pottery but it's only about a third of the pottery problem. So we need, need to expand there. In Indonesia, similarly, we'll only focus in, uh, in Java and only a part of Java and, and so on and so forth. So clearly, we, this whole effort needs to expand substantively. Um, and we, we need broader partnerships, a much bigger base of people who are involved in this issue and more, more funding, of course, to do more work, and more buy-in from national governments. Mm -hmm. So our main uh, precept behind PECP is that platform base that Drew was talking about, to create the awareness and the groundswell to deal with this issue at scale. And I just want to point out that it's worth doing this because of a couple of key things that came out of the uh, Toxic Truth Report. One is um, that the burden of disease is, is enormous. It's a million deaths a year, more or less, which is, you know, compare that to COVID it's at a million this year and look at the attention that's got. This is every year. But second, um, because there's an a intelligence loss, you know, of three to five points for, you know, in many countries, more than half of the population, that means that half of the population isn't as smart as they should be. They're not as productive as they should be. Smarter people are more productive. They earn more. 
over their lifetimes. Each IQ point in the US added means you earn more of your lifetime by tens of thousands of dollars. And it also means that there's not as much entrepreneurial activity. So having this brain drain caused by this chemical, it reduces the potential for economic growth and, and therefore lifting people out of poverty. And it doesn't do this in a tiny way. It does it in an enormous way. The World Bank's calculations say that it's 2% of GDP in Asia and 4% of GDP in Africa. So it's not just a health problem, but it's an economic uh, development problem of enormous scale. And the third issue, this other issue that's still somewhat pending um, is if it is actually associative with violent activity, um, you know, the statistics are that violence reduces by as much as uh, three quarters when lead levels come down. I mean, we, we can't even begin to quantify the social benefit of seeing reductions in violence in, in, across the country. There's local benefit, there's, there's security issues that are improved through all of this. Clearly, all of those things put this one particular problem right up the top to be of, as significant as the HIV crisis, as climate change, as any other significant global problem. So that's, how, that's where we want to take this partnership, to elevate it so that people recognize that this is something of enormity that we ought to be dealing with at the international level, at the country level, and so on. Wonderful. And, and Mark Weinreich, in, in, in that same vein, asked if there's a specific field project being taken to help catalyze awareness and stakeholder procurement. I know that Drew redressed that a little bit, but maybe we could address that a bit more. And, and with the final couple of minutes, uh, maybe uh, also uh, you know, speak to the fact of how individuals can also get involved and be very supportive of this initiative and the programs that Pure Earth is, is, a, is a powering forward. Yeah, go ahead, Drew. Well, all three of the founding members of PECP have committed to kind of global outreach, information sharing and awareness raising. So we hope that that brings lots of people to our door to ask how they can get engaged. And what we are going to do is to engage each of those people individual because there will be different engagement routes uh, potentially for private sector entities versus individuals versus nonprofits or national governments. Um, so we'd love to have each of those conversations individually. Um, so if someone is curious about how to get involved, we encourage them to reach out to our development director at Pure Earth, Carol Sumpkin, who is carol at pureearth.org, um, to start that in that conversation. And she can put people in touch with, of course, our uh, co-founders at UNICEF and Clarios Foundation. Wonderful. Well, I think that kind of wraps up our, our, our Q&A period here. Um, thanks everyone so much for putting your questions in and I think I'll, I'll pass it over to Rich to, to say a few closing remarks and, um, and uh, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming along. And again, this is a, an issue that, you know, we can all get involved with. We're at the early stages. It's like the beginning, cracking an egg into what will become uh, an enormous, you know, 100 feet wide omelet, which is taking the very, very first steps to it. And, um, and so I really encourage anyone who, who sees interest in this and getting involved in this. And Paul, I noticed you had a question around e-waste. It is a part of the equation. E-waste and ULAB recycling are kind of brother and sister in their collection networks and the rest of it. And so there are, there are lessons to be learned in how ULABs need to be treated that have been done well in one country that can be brought to other countries that will mirror how e-waste needs to be treated as well. It's an evolving thing. So if folk who want to get involved in this and move along this path into what we expect will become, you know, uh, really a global issue, uh, do get in touch with us. Um, there is pathways to join PECP uh, for the private sector and for international agencies as well. Um, I really welcome anyone to connect with me directly. I'm fuller at pureearth.org or to Carol. Again, she's carol at pureearth.org. And uh, this is a place that 
you know, in our lifetimes, we can make the kind of impact that we always wanted to do when we were kids. We can change the world for the better. So uh, that's, that's for me why this is so exciting. Great. Thanks, everyone. Stay Thank safe. You Thank you.